Welcome back, everyone. We have another show today, and we have quite a few people on standby. Uh, of course, I have to give my disclaimer. Anything that I say is not meant to cure you or diagnose you or replace your medical care. Check with your doctors before taking any of my advice. Welcome. All right. So yeah, Welcome, uh, everyone. So uh, we have got a full green room of people coming to us from around the world, and I think one of your old haunts, uh, Dr. Berg in Washington, we have Meg. And Meg has been uh, standing by dutifully for over an hour. Meg, you are on with Dr. Berg with your one question, please. Yes. Hello, Dr. Berg. Hi, Meg. Hi. Hey, um, I have chronic fatigue syndrome, and um, I had a question about weight and the keto diet. Um, about six years ago, I got down to 112 pounds. Uh, by fasting um, for about 18 to 20 hours a day. Um, but I would starve myself and go to sleep starving, and I was really depressed. Now I, uh, <laughs> six years later, weigh about 137 to 142. And, you know, I, I'd, I'd like to get back down to 120. Um, I have a really hard time at 10 o'clock at night because I don't know what happens. I just want to start eating. Um, and then I feel crappy the next morning. So how do I mentally prepare myself not to eat after 10 PM? Well, I think we need to get your body to work with you. It seems like it's working against you because it's really hard to do this with cravings because it takes so much willpower, so much discipline. It's almost literally impossible. So the question is when you eat, um, are you on a low carb diet when you eat? No. You're not? No. Yeah, that's the problem because what happens is when you eat and the carbs are too high, it's going to keep your hunger there. So what we want to do is we want to completely switch over your body to being fat adapted, which means no cravings, hunger goes away. It's oh. easy. It's so easy to do it when your body is not craving. Could you imagine like going to bed without any cravings? How easy uh. that would be? That'd be heaven. <laughs> yeah. So it's real simple. You just keep your carbs uh, below about 30 grams, maybe even less. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's why I always recommend doing the keto with the intermittent fasting. And uh, you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna just really win on that. So uh, that's really the secret. Now, your inflammation for fibromyalgia might clear up just from that alone. But I have a oh. question. Is yeah. the fibromyalgia more on the right side of your body or left or all over left left side um i think um that is related to your digestion and so when you start doing keto correctly um i think uh, and i would get my book just to read the chapter to make sure you get it down perfectly but i think that um left-sided um fibromyalgia will go away because i think it's related to um your, either your pancreas or your, your digestive system that's bloated. And uh, that way you can kill two birds with one stone. How about that? Perfect. Boy, that's yeah. terrific, Meg. Well, enjoy the rainy Washington. i um, always been fascinated by uh, how people <laughs> survive all that, but I understand it's just absolutely gorgeous. So anyway, Dr. Berg, uh, thanks again, Meg. And why don't we kick things off with uh, our first quiz question of the day. And here we go. All right, so what is the most common nutrient deficiency associated with irritable bowel disease? So Crohn's, uh, ulcerative colitis, you have inflammation in your gut. What is the most common nutrient deficiency? That's the first question of the day. All right, wonderful, folks. I tell you what, um, our internet's been a little spotty, so we want to make sure we get these folks. Simon has uh, dutifully logged back in once after we lost him, and he's from the lovely U.K., and has some interesting questions for us. Simon, you're on with Simon. Excuse me, you're on with Dr. Berg. Dr. Berg, thank you so much. What a what a thrill to be on here today. So, I, I had a question that's actually about muscle. So, I'm looking to add muscle whilst intermittent fasting. Now, a bit of background: I had quite a sugar addiction, uh, which I've now spent a number of months being off. I've overcome it. I've trained my mind. I'm really on the game. Um, body's looking good. I'm down to healthy like it's 13 and a half stone i guess it's 18185 um my bmi is good i know bmi is not everything and my weight's good so i've got to the point where my wife's saying you need to just look a little bit bigger i love you know i like lifting weights all that stuff so 
I've got to a good place, but I'm wondering, you know, sh- how do I do the muscle gain thing with intermittent fasting? I'm not, it's not about being on Instagram for me. It's just for something I enjoy doing. What protein should I be having? Three to six ounces. Should I count calories? So that's, that's where I'm Yeah. There, there's a, there's obviously not a, a magic calorie amount for everyone, but here's, here's some things that I would do. You definitely need to increase your calories to the point where you're, you know, you're really nice and full with those meals, you know, um, you want to have adequate amount of protein, not to go crazy, but you need probably about eight ounces of protein with each me- meal. I would do two meals a day. Um, and then what I would do is I would, uh, your workouts need to stimulate the muscle growth. And that means you have to increase the uh, uh, volume of exercise um, and enough stimulus so um, your muscles can respond by hypertrophy and getting, getting bigger. So, you, you know, compound resistance, um, enough um, workout. So you may need, need to hire a personal trainer to kind of put yourself in that situation, but you want to keep that workout in, keep your calories just a little higher, adequate amount of protein, and maybe just keep your, your carbs not, not over 50 grams, but maybe right at 50 grams. So the berries would work, hummus would work. Um, but that's really um, what I would do if I were you. And I think you'll, you'll bulk up, but um, you know, versus doing like some type of long distance running, <laughs> no, you're not gonna, you're not gonna bulk up with that. You're gonna have to stimulate the muscle growth and um, work the upper and lower part of your body for sure. So um, there's a, there's some great videos that I did where I just kind of studied some of the some of the um, people that are actually doing this for real and competing. And uh, I mean, they basically, they push themselves to um, fatigue and then they get a spotter to help them go even beyond the fatigue. So you're really just creating a huge stimulus of that muscle. And then you give your, your body a chance to recover. And that would be the best thing you can do. Thank you, thank you. And and are you in kidneys, all right. By the way, in terms of pressure on kidneys, like was that hundred grams per meal or three to six, eight ounces? Is that all right in the kidneys? Do you think it's not going to be a kidney? You, you, you know, the data on the the high protein with kidney, it's um, there's not any data that shows that if you can you consume even high protein with healthy kidneys, that that's going to create any damage to your kidney. It, the studies are done if you have maybe kidney damage already, which I highly doubt that you have kidney damage. So, uh, and we're talking eight ounce of protein is not, uh, not terribly high. Um, mm-hmm. and so I think you can get away with it, but we just want adequate amount of protein. And of course, the quality of protein, the type of protein is important too, because, uh, people that get their protein from soy, for example, or even whey protein versus, um, protein like from eggs or meat that has more fat in it would be way better as far as the absorption of that protein because the fat slows down the digestion in the small intestine, allowing for the enzymes to work on that protein and help you absorb them versus consuming some very low fat lean protein that goes through you fast and you really don't get much absorbed. So yeah, and then don't don't buy into the whole thing where you need to consume branch amino acids or protein right before or after a workout, it's, it's, it's not true. Your body's going to, um, then you're just going to shut off the benefits of that workout, which is, um, you know, you stimulate and growth hormone, then you eat and then you just kind of shut off that, that benefit. So yeah, that's, that's what I would do. Thank you. Thank you so much indeed. Much appreciated. You're welcome. Thanks for coming on. That's great. Thanks for coming on everybody. And let's see, why don't we go to the answer for our first quiz question today? which asks the most common nutrient deficiency associated with irritable bowel syndrome. And our audience, 50% say vitamin B and 50% say iodine. Are they onto something, Doc? Well, I don't think they're onto something. Um, I'm going to release this video. It's, a, it's actually an iron deficiency. A iron deficiency as the first, uh, first place winner as far as a deficiency. And the number two would be vitamin D. The inflammation in the gut prevents the absorption of those nutrients. So this is why if you're taking even vitamin D and you have inflammation, it's just another layer of 
resistance that you have to bust through. And then on top of that, if you have insulin resistance, <laughs> you're not going to absorb vitamin D. And then it's difficult to get it from the food. So this is why I always recommend going up a little bit more with your vitamin D to penetrate these barriers that people have, especially if you have uh, inflammation in the gut or a history of gut damage. You may even need minimally 20,000 IUs or more to, to see the results. Uh, and of course, you can always get it tested to see if you're you're doing okay. Um, but yeah, vitamin uh, iron is is a is a is the number one thing. So if you are male and you're taking iron, you, that's the only thing you have to be a little careful about because your body has a hard time getting rid of it because you don't menstruate like women. So you don't. Our bodies tend to retain iron and calcium. So have an adequate amount, but don't go crazy. And maybe you get your iron from your food, um, which you can get it from, you know, organic grass-fed red meats. Um, spinach doesn't have the the type of iron that a body uses, um, but spirulina is a is a, another source of iron, which is uh, interesting. I'm going to do a video on that, and you can watch that next week. Well, that's terrific. Well, audience, we truly love all of you, but we're a little disappointed. There was zero right answers on that last one, but don't dismay because we're going to give you another chance to redeem yourself with this next question, Dr. <laughs> Berg. All right. So what type of food has the most phytic acid? Acid. Now, phytic acid is, a, um, is an acid in certain foods that prevent the absorption of minerals like zinc and calcium and magnesium and iron. Um, so some of you know about that, some of you don't, but it's something that kind of locks up or binds these minerals. Um, and that's all I'm going to give you. So let's see if you could tell me what group of foods, it's kind of like a category of foods, has the most phytic acid. And, uh, and it, it's certain, so something in a food that tends to prevent prevent the digestion of it and also well that's all i'm going to say all right without giving it to giving it to you all right wonderful folks good luck in redeeming yourself and now let's talk about folks and where they're coming from a good morning to all our viewers coming from the uk canada taiwan sweden serbia excuse me my list is slipping away from me zambia i've been there lovely people germany the philippines jordan spain france algeria india we've got a couple of folks celebrating a great holiday there today with us the netherlands australia belgium chile saudi arabia uh, israel dubai denmark mexico peru scotland austria panama iran qatar italy can you believe this malaysia and you know what? I don't think I saw the Philippines, and they yelled at us last week for not mentioning that they were there. So I'm going to throw them in. I know they're out there watching. And then, of course, all across these United States. So welcome, everyone. We're so glad to have you as a part of the show. And speaking of those folks, Rose from Facebook says she's been on keto for nearly a year, and she's lacking nutrients. She doesn't sort of talk about which ones, but uh, and to break down her food, and my head burns, my joints ache. What's going on? How can we help Rose, who's trying to be dutifully on keto? Didn't say whether it's not rotten keto or whatever, but anyway. One, one thing that's, you mean dirty keto. Thank what, you. Um, what, what happens, though, when you do keto and you start getting inflammation, the most common reason is either you're not doing it correct or you're, um, you're not doing omega-3 fatty acids. It's really important, um, especially for people that do a lot of fasting and they might not consider the omega-3 fatty acids as something that's an anti-inflammatory and you need a lot of it. So brain needs it, the heart needs it. Um, so fish oil or cod liver oil is a really good source. Um, but also, so, so when you do keto and also you do, especially intermittent fasting, the B vitamins from nutritional yeast and the electrolytes, those two are the requirements to keep you from developing keto fatigue and keto flu. Don't forget the sea salts. Very, very important. I'm going to do a video on that. Uh, if you omit the sea salts, you're going to feel weak when you do keto. You may feel like you have the keto flu, but it's not the flu. It's just that you need a little salt. Um, I actually need a lot. So uh, that's going to be also one of our questions coming up real quick. All right, that's terrific. Now let's go over to Sharon from Facebook. What's the best thing to drink to cleanse the bowels and the gut? Is that necessary, Doc? Well, if you want to cleanse the bowel, okay, your bowels, so you want to um, increase um, 
those things that support the um, the microbes. <clears throat> so, you know, as far as drinking goes, you just want to keep your sugar low. But as far as consuming food, you want to have food that is like these things called, let's see, what was the name of that? Um, vegetables. So the fiber in the vegetables feed the microbes, and then they start developing um, all sorts of wonderful acids, um, like lactic acid. And that way, these acids can then um, prevent pathogens and uh, promote regular bowel movements. And uh, that's the best way to reduce uh, toxic waste in your gut. Uh, and also intermittent fasting is another way. But as far as drinking to cleanse, I mean, you could do various things to do that with like, let's say you do uh, spirulina drinks. Uh, um, I, I wouldn't... Uh, necessarily try to detoxify yourself, uh, your colon with certain other drinks, because I've experimented on that and I've gotten sick so many times because I'm, I'm purging certain poisons and things. So um, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do that. I would, I would cleanse my liver and my body by consuming healthy foods and especially the cruciferous vegetables, which will uh, increase the enzymes. And then you get phase one, phase two, detoxification so they break down these poisons into harmless particles well that's terrific all right well we got some answers for our quiz question number two what type of food is uh has the most phytic acid did i say that right doc phytic acid yeah, that's right. Phytic okay acid. well yeah. the the audience uh, 30 percent of them say red bell peppers 20 percent say beans or legumes 30 percent say peanuts or legumes and 20 percent say chickpeas how are we doing Okay, so uh, we need we need some work on that. I will release the video on that. But oh, audience, um, it's actually nuts. Okay, nut the nut family um, has the most phytic acid, which is actually quite surprising because you would think it would be the grains. Now, I'm not suggesting eat, eating grains, but this is another reason why when you consume nuts and you start having pain in your stomach, then we know why. So. The best solution is to soak your nuts and uh, in water overnight uh, and the seeds. Just let them soak and then wash them out 24 hours later and then dry them out and then eat them and watch what happens to your digestive system. It's like they'll really digest very nicely. So it's called germination or you're sprouting them. Now, this only goes for the raw nuts. It doesn't go for the roasted nuts. So um, this is why probably you can digest roasted nuts better. But if you're going to dump all these raw nuts into your in your stomach and you're just going to boy you're going to end up with a a lot of bloating and issues with that. So don't forget to germinate your nuts, Steve. Well, I'm going to have that that's my uh, highest priority, doctor. Make sure okay, I good. do that. All right. So K from YouTube is keto good for someone who's always been skinny. That's an interesting question, kind of like what Meg was talking about sometime earlier. I, I think so. I think so because um, skinny people have other issues as well, right? They don't, people just associate obesity with all the problems, but um, there's a thing called skinny fat. You can have a fatty liver and still look skinny. Um, whether you are overweight or underweight doesn't really tell you how healthy you are. So the, the benefit of keto and intermittent fasting for a skinny person is huge mental clarity, more focus, better memory. Uh, better mood, um, better um, higher IQ, less stress. Um, it's a more of efficient um, fuel system in the body. So there's so many benefits, um, even, even preventing cancer, because what causes cancer is a chronic consumption of certain things that create inflammation, like glucose, right? So if you go on a low-carb diet, you, you reduce the damage to your mitochondria, therefore preventing things, disease, chronic disease, uh, inflammation, and, and even cancer. So um, there is a certain protocol for can uh, once you get cancer, that's not necessarily just the keto plan. And I've talked about that in certain videos, but I'm not going to get down that rapid hole in this video. All right. Well, that's terrific. Let's move on to the next question. Uh, ever hopeful that the audience gets it right. Uh, go ahead, Doc, read it for us, please. Why do wheat products in Europe give you less bloating than those in America? <clears throat> so 
a lot of Americans go on a trip to Europe and then all of a sudden they eat wheat and they're like, oh my gosh, my stomach doesn't bloat like it does in America. <clears throat> all right, audience, why do you think um, there's a difference? What's the, what's the, the main differences? See if you can guess this one. Well, well, Simon, and our previous I'm not recommending it, Steve. Yeah, Simon, our, our previous intern is beaming with pride because he's in Europe, of course, and now very proud of his grains and so on. So, Simon, uh, good for you, and the rest of them. But go ahead, audience, dig into that one, and let's go to Linda from Facebook. She has inflammatory arth inflammatory, excuse me, arthritis, and was told to stay away from all salts. How can I get the right amount of electrolytes without consuming salt? That's a conundrum. You know, you get advice from so many people. Um, I think that would be bad advice. Um, our bodies require a certain amount of sodium every day. <clears throat> and then if we don't get enough sodium, we feel weak. Uh, sodium is necessary for the stress response. So the more stress you go through, the more sodium you need. Um, so I think at a very minimum, you need three and a half grams of sodium. That's a, a, tea, a teaspoon and a half of um, salt. Um, so I think for an average person on keto and doing intermittent fasting, two teaspoons of sea salt would be ideal. Well, that's fantastic. Well, by the way, over in uh, wonderful India, there's a lot of celebration going on today. Uh, and Krishnan, and we have another gentleman, the Sanjay, which will come up a little later. Uh, they both are, are uh, enjoying firecrackers or whatever they do as a part of that. And he has a question related to keto and uh hang on sanjay let me make sure that you're unmuted you're on with dr bird Krishnan, excuse me uh is it krishnan or uh, sanjay no sorry it's krishnan you are on thank you thank you dr bug it's a pleasure talking to you uh dr bug i am a diabetic for the last 17 years on intermittent fasting for the last uh, 18 months after listening to your video i do five days intermittent fasting and two day fa total fasting 24 hour fasting and my HOMA IR was around five. Uh, that was in March 2020. And now it has reached uh, 1.8. Uh, this was around one week back. But my uh, insulin, HP1AC remains almost the same, a constant at 6.5 and 7. And I don't know why, uh, where I'm, I'm a runner. I run 10, almost around 10 kilometers a day and still, uh, I'm so, I'm so, so I have a question for you. Yes. Um, are there times during the week or the month that maybe your carbs are a little bit higher? Uh, maybe once a month. I have a cheating day. Okay. So realize an A1C is an average of three months. Right. So if you cheat on one of those days of the, in the three months... It's uh -huh. going to give you an average amount versus a blood sugar is going to test you right at that moment. So those people who are not consistent enough are not going to show an A1C low, low enough or down to where you want the numbers. So that's really why I, I had another person run into the same thing. They weren't, they were doing great. And then they had the cheat day and then, it kind of it's gonna it's gonna throw off your averages. Oh, um, I see. So, um, I think I think what you should do is bite the bullet and try an experiment and don't don't cheat for three okay. months and go get it tested and watch your numbers come right down. Then you'll know for sure. Okay. Right. And one other question is: whey is uh, can we use whey uh, weekly once? Did you say whey protein? That's correct. Yeah, um, I don't. I don't like uh, whey protein. The reason is because there's something, and I talk about this in my book, that talks about the insulin scale, not the glycemic index, but the in the, uh, insulin index. We can call it. And um, guess what is pretty darn high on that scale? It's whey protein. Why? Because it's so extremely low in fat. It's unnatural. Uh, the protein um, is never meant to in nature to come and that concentrated amount. So it's kind of a refined product. So I, I, I don't like it. So I would consume protein with, with higher amounts of fat. 
and uh, yeah. and your body will actually do much better with it. In fact, uh, whey protein too is not that uh, absorbable. It's like it, it might get absorbed, but it doesn't really turn replace right into uh, the muscle tissues. I I talked uh, about that in a certain video with um, there's a certain um, I'm, I don't want to get into it, but it has to do with nitrogen and how it goes into the muscle and eggs. Well, breast milk is number one, and then eggs, and then whey protein is way down on the list it's not the best source of protein for people okay in fact i know when i even consume it i literally feel exa- tired I-, I think because probably i have an allergy to um some of the milk proteins but it could also be the concentration of, of protein so yeah that's why that's great. Well, enjoy your holiday, uh, uh, Krishna. Thank you. So glad to have you on. And let's see, why don't we go to our social media folks. Esmeralda from YouTube, can too much salt and apple cider vinegar cause arthritis? No, no. I think apple cider vinegar is going to help you with arthritis. Um, it's going to reduce inflammation. It supports also um, uh, insulin sensitivity. So um, that's good. And then also um, salt uh, does not worsen arthritis. In fact, it supports the adrenal, thereby supporting cortisol. And cortisol is a natural anti-inflammatory. So I don't think that inflammation is coming from salt or apple cider vinegar. Terrific. Well, Jennifer from Facebook says she just started taking vitamin E and now she's gaining weight, Dag Nabbit. Why? I've been on healthy keto for three years. So vitamin E, it must be something else. I've never heard that before. I, I, I can't imagine vitamin E is going to cause someone to gain weight. So I would really like to assess like all the different other things that you're doing and see if there's something else. But I, I've never heard that vitamin E doing that. It actually probably, if you take uh, the right type of vitamin E, which I recommend to- tocotrienols, that should support female hormones and help you help your metabolism in theory. So I would really look at some other variables to see if it's not something else. Um, I don't know if it's vitamin E. I, I highly doubt it. All I'm right. not saying it's you're not gaining you're not gaining weight, but I don't think that's the cause. Well, we wish you all the best, Farjan from Facebook. We're talking about uh, apple cider again. How often should I consume apple cider, and will it reduce my cholesterol? It's, it's been known to reduce cholesterol. Why? Because it helps stabilize the blood sugars. And what's that have to do with anything? Well, higher blood glucose converts into cholesterol and triglycerides. So that's the connection there. Um, but I would consume it with meals, like take a tablespoon or, or two in some water and take it with meals. Or you can even do that mixture right before bed uh, or through the day when you're thirsty. Um, kind of go by how you you um, have a craving for it because you might get to a point where I had enough. I, I don't need any more, but you don't want to consume it uh, straight. Let's see if I, I was looking around to see if I have my bottle. I, I don't have it around here, but um, I, I consume a lot of apple cider vinegar. In fact, I bought a hundred gallons of this apple cider vinegar and I feed it to um, some of the wild horses out there and also some of the cattle. They, they love it. You mix it with water they drink it like crazy because it helps their digestion. Interesting. Okay, we're going to get to a, an answer here from our latest quiz question. But first up, and people are picking on salt today. Uh, Doc, this is awful. Lord from YouTube, my creatine levels are high. If I stop consuming salt, will that help? Um, no, 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 it won't. Um, I did a video on that topic. Um, search it out, watch it. There's a lot to be said about that. But no, the salt is not the culprit. That's wonderful because I grind away all of my meals. I just love it. So here we go. Quiz question number three. Why do wheat products in Europe give you less bloating than those in America? And our audience, um, 90% say glyphosates or pesticides. 10% say GMOs. You know, um, you're right. You're absolutely right. It's the glyphosate. That's a chemical that's a a herbicide that they use. It's like Roundup Ready. Um, and, uh, so this glyphosate, um, really messes with your microbes in your gut. And so you're going to not feel too good when you consume foods, uh, that have that chemical in it. 
There's something else too, and that is the type of wheat. And I'm just giving it generality because it's not 100% in every country. For example, I think even in the UK, they have this very similar wheat that they have in America. So you have um, red wheat, which is kind of a soft, doughy, it's preserved longer in America, versus the white wheat in Europe, which is um, it's uh, less protein. And I'm talking about gluten. So in Europe, there's less uh, gluten than there is in America. So gluten really reacts with our guts. There's also certain countries in Sweden and um, several other ones that don't, I think even France, that don't fortify, which is I think is a good thing because when they fortify, they put some synthetic vitamins in there and they put this uh, a lot of iron in, in, in the wheat. Um, the problem is that iron is not the type that our body can digest very easily. So you're dumping all this iron, it sits in your gut, it enhances pathogenic bacteria. So again, it affects the microbes. So we have glyphosate, we have higher gluten, we have um, higher amounts of iron. And so, and also in Europe, a lot of times when they make certain products, they, they let the dough rise or ferment uh, a lot longer than in America, which makes things easier to digest. Which, um, so that being said, I'm not promoting eating wheat because that's not keto, but I'm just telling you why you feel less bloated. Well, that's wonderful. I'm glad they're not suffering as we do here stateside. Uh, speaking of, well, she's not suffering. Linda from Facebook lost 65 pounds on keto and IF uh, last year. Congratulations to you. However, her cholesterol is now very high. My doctor recommended switching from keto to the Mediterranean diet. Thoughts, please. You know, why don't you just do the Mediterranean diet with uh, keto? And that way you do, you increase uh, maybe more olives and um, fish and that type of food. But to start to go up with carbs to lower your cholesterol would be going in the opposite direction. The reason why, and I have to say this at every show, the reason why your cholesterol is high on keto for certain people is because when you lose weight, you're releasing fat from your fat cell. Well, what is in the fat cell? What type of fat? Well, you have triglycerides, which is used for fuel, but you also have cholesterol in the fat cell that's coming out. And we can't use cholesterol for fuel. So that just has to come out through the liver. So if your liver is already fatty or you don't have enough bile because your gallbladder is maybe sluggish, then the cholesterol will tend to go higher. That's still not a concern because of the recent guidelines, even by the various agencies, said that there's actually no association between having higher cholesterol and increasing your risk of dying or having a heart attack. So you really don't have to worry about it. Uh, but if you're concerned, just take some purified bile salts uh, and you'll find that your cholesterol will come down or do an advanced lipid profile test and uh, check the specific type of LDL you have and I will almost guarantee it won't be the small dense particle size. It'll be the large buoyant type of LDL that's not harmful at all. Now that's very encouraging. Okay, I tell you what, uh, why don't we go back to our green room and we're going to select uh, uh, Shatamar. I hope I've said that right, sir. And he is uh, actually uh, from uh, Nigeria, but he's visiting London. Uh, where they have uh, much less bloating. Go ahead. Oh, if you unmute yourself, sir. Hi, Dr. Berg. Hello. Yeah, um, with great, uh, great gratitude to be on your show. I lost over 40 kg following your show. Wow. Yes. Yeah, my question is just simple and straight in regards to glaucoma. Is there any advice you're going to give us? Glaucoma. Glaucoma, got it. Okay. Yeah. The glaucoma is, um, is actually one of the symptoms that a diabetic has because their blood sugars um, are too high. And, and out of all the tissues, the, one of, the eye is one of the tissues that's most sensitive to high glucose and even increasing pressure because you're not allowing the drainage system to occur. 
So you have this, uh, this pressure in the eye. Um, the absolute best thing to do is to do the opposite diet that a diabetic does, which is the keto. Do the healthy version of keto, bring your carbs down, and let the eye heal up. However, there is a couple things that you should do in addition to healthy keto and intermittent fasting for glaucoma. Uh, one would be to take a product you can order online called Benfotamine. That is a fat-soluble B vitamin, which is really good to decrease the complications of diabetes and uh, support, and that's going to help your eye. is is not just glaucoma, but it will help reduce the risk of getting um, uh, diabetic retinopathy, which is a destruction of the retina. And then the other thing, too, is um, berberine is a good um, herb to take for um, for eye support as well, as a glaucoma and other types of eye problems. So that's what I would recommend. I've done several videos on glaucoma. You can check it out. And there are some natural remedies that you can take. Um, you can check those out as well. Thank you. You're welcome. Well, that's terrific. Thanks for joining us, Dr. Bergen. Let's, uh, or excuse me, thanks for joining us, Shadama. And let's see, what else are we going to do? We need another quiz popped up here. And here we go back to salt, Dr. Berg. Yeah, so, okay, so this is the question for those people who are asking about salt. Which has more sodium, sea salt or the dead sea salt from the Dead Sea? All right, dig into that, folks. And then let's, excuse me, let's see. So Marissa from YouTube. Hi, Dr. Berg, you're amazing. And a lot of people share that sentiment. I'm a type 1 diabetic since I was 2, and now I'm 39. Oops, that question slipped away. Here we are. I'm tired, brittle, and losing hope. I took your body type quiz, and I'm getting answers that apply to multiple body types. Help! What can we do for people that have type 1? That's, that's a tough one. Yeah, don't, don't, let, don't get too confused about the body types at this point. I would just jump right into the basic keto plan. It's right on my blog at drberg.com. And just, there's like three videos you watch right in a row. Bam, 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 get started. Um, you can even, you know, you don't even have to buy the newer book that I have on Kindle. It's actually on Amazon. You can get it free by going to my website. Don't tell anyone. Um, download. But here's the thing. Here's the thing. Oh, I hear it. Um, okay, so um, I would just get started with the basic keto plan. Don't worry about adjusting it to your body type yet. And then in my book, if you do plan to get that, the bigger book, um, you can then tailor make the program to your body type after a couple of weeks if, you're, if your results aren't where they should be. Because you may find if you have like a chronic adrenal problem, for example, or versus like a, a liver problem, you may need to tweak it just to, to that body type. So that's just a kind of a, a layer of complexity that I don't want you to worry about right now. Just get started with the basic plan and then um, low carb, moderate protein, higher fat, and uh, get your body back. You've had diabetes for a very long time, so it means that you have a lot of insulin resistance. So um, this is the exact plan you need to do. Um, Verda Health, the, the, some of the science researchers at Verda Health have um, done some serious research on reversing diabetes. And so that's the area that, um, that I would focus on, like some hardcore evidence, because going high, I mean, think about what diabetes is. It's a, it's a condition of high blood sugar. So why would you want to do anything other than lower your blood glucose. I mean, it doesn't make sense to me to, well, let's try this diet. Well, no, no, just get off sugar. That's get off carbs. That's the most important thing. Well, that makes good sense. Speaking of sugar, Lorraine from YouTube, she's lost 151 pounds so far on keto wow. and intermittent fasting. Congratulations, Lorraine. And uh, we're also glad to report that her cholesterol is lower than ever, but my sugar is higher than ever. How can that possibly be? Well, um, did she say she's doing keto and intermittent fasting? She did. Okay, so if your glucose is high, then the question is, where could it be coming from? I mean, you're not eating sugar. Well, it's coming from your liver. If you have really advanced chronic insulin resistance and a fatty liver or, or something like that, what will happen is your, your liver will actually, you don't have the... the um, the ability to 
to fine tune and regulate your blood sugars like you like you should have. And what happens is your body ends up making sugar out of ketones and out of fat. It's called gluconeogenesis. So the, that's what happens to even in a diabetic situation is not only is the sugar from the diet raising your blood sugar, but your body's making sugar out of other things raising your blood sugar. And um, that will go away as you do keto and intermittent fasting over time. The best thing to do is to um, keep the sh- keep in the, the main keto plan, do more fasting, and do a little exercise to burn off this excess sugar. Uh, I don't really consider it a big problem if, you're, if your carbs are low because it's coming from your body. Your body's just making more. So that's, that's really what's happening. Well, I guess a terrific sort of problem to have, if you will. She's done so well. Boy, that's a massive amount of weight, and that's just she must feel like a million bucks. So we will hope that your sugar gets in line soon. And why don't we go back to some quiz questions. This one not related to sugar, but rather to salt. Which has more sodium, sea salt or dead sea salt? And our audience, 60% say the dead sea salt, 34% say regular sea salt. Any winners today, Doc? Well, you would think logically that it would be the dead sea salt because it's so salty, right? It's a salty lake, Um, but... It only has 8% sodium. Isn't that bizarre? Oh, my gosh. And sea salt has a 90% and table salt has 98% sodium. So what, uh, what does, sea, what does the, the dead sea salt have that the sea salt doesn't have? It, it's very, very high in magnesium and very high in potassium. But it's not for consumption. You don't want to consume salt from the dead sea. It's... It's meant more for topically because it's a great therapy to put topically on your body, on your skin, uh, for on your to soak in, in in a bath. Like you take a half a cup, put it in your bathtub, and it's great for your joints, arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis. Um, it's good for keeping your skin youthful. They have the different, um, I guess the mud, not the mud baths, but they're like mud ma- masks that you can, you with the Dead Sea salts you can put on your face. Put some mud on your face, and um, but don't consume it because it's very. It doesn't taste like sea salt, um, even though it's super concentrated. But it would be beneficial to maybe swim in the Dead Sea and float around, and um, you can try that as well, Steve, if you have some spare time. Well, I absolutely will. Now, let's see. Uh, apparently, uh, Descent, I think her name is, has spare time to be on YouTube. And she wants to know, and this is an oft-asked question, um, is uh, there a connection between keto and hair loss? And before you answer that, I just want to say that many of you only see the uh, front side of Dr. Berg, and you're thinking, what's going on on the south side there? He's got a full head of hair. So does Karen, just like a lion's mane. And so there, there's the proof, and there's no hair loss. So both of them are, you know, devout... uh, uh, you know, keto and intermittent fasting. So it just doesn't have to be. I mean, they just got the fullest head of hair in the world. So Dr. Berg, uh, what are these people doing and what would a remedy be for them to, uh, you know, stave off the hair loss? They have some great specials that, uh, on two to pays right now or, <laughs> and, and wigs um, that you can get. But if you want to salvage your hair, um, what you want to do is with keto, it's really You see, when you do keto and intermittent fasting, um, there's certain nutrients, nutrient requirements that go up. And if you don't take them, you could, and you already have a deficiency going in, like to your trace minerals, um, you can end up with, or B vitamins, you can end up with potentially hair loss. Um, It's rare, but it can happen. So in that case, you take the trace minerals, you take your B vitamins from nutritional yeast, and that pretty much will handle it. Um, now, of course, I'm not biased of my own products, but this is hair formula that a lot of people are using. It's pretty cool. And, but this is an, this is an upgraded formula because I've been experimenting on it and I'm very, very excited about the new formula because it's, it's even better than the old formula and, uh, and that worked great too. So I'm always constantly finding better ways to, um, tweak the formulas to get better results. So, um, my staff hates that because I'm constantly changing things 
and they have to constantly update it. But um, but mainly it's, it's just going to be the trace minerals and it's going to be the B vitamins that are going to help you with your hair, uh, especially during keto. Well, that's terrific. Dr. Berg, let's put the audience back to work. All right. So what's the common cause of chronic pain and tightness on the right side of your neck? So if you have this tightness on the right side of the neck or a pain and you're, I don't know, going to the chiropractor for years and it's not going away, why? Why is that? What could you do about it? What's going on? All right, What's audience, behind this problem? Climb on that. Okay. Lila from Facebook, Dr. Berg, do you recommend mullion tea for detox of the lungs for smokers? Boy, I hope she quit. Are you talking about the um, bullion cubes or, or a type of tea? Well, she said uh, mullion with an M, not bullion. Oh, mullion. Oh, mullion, mullion tea. Yes, sir. Um, yes, that is actually a good remedy, and uh, I I would recommend it. There's there's quite a few fascinating herb teas out there, naturally decaffeinated, that have some amazing effects. Um, I've done videos on it before, and um, I'm going to be releasing... Um, a PDF book. It's 335 pages on the various remedies that are on my YouTube videos. I didn't realize how many I had. So the problem is trying to consume that much information on the YouTube channels because there's a roughly 6,000 videos. So what I did is I summarized it in my spare time in one document and uh, it's called Remedies. And that's going to be available real, real soon. And I also have another one on summarizing all the other videos, like the con- symptoms and the conditions and their causes. So that way you have one document that summarizes 6,000 videos and it's used as a reference if you need quick data versus trying to do uh, a deep dive. Because I'm, it's really frustrating since last October, um, there's been a shift I noticed in the search engines on YouTube and it's, it's becoming harder to find my videos. And I mean, I, if you type even Dr. Berg in a specific thing, like it doesn't even show up. And so anyway, that's the problem. So that's why we have a lot of these videos on my website and under the blog, as well as in this new document, these two documents that I'm going to be releasing very soon within a week. So stay tuned. Terrific, Dr. Berg. I'm going to poke in here because I'm interested in this question. Roberto from YouTube, is long-term OMAD safe? How much attention should I pay to my macros? Thanks for all of the information. And Dr. Berg, I've been doing that for, you know, I don't know, a couple of years now. And it's just intriguing. I, I'm not sure where anyone thought that you have to eat three times a day. Humans historically used to chase their lunch, right? And I don't think they had the energy to do that three times a day. So, I mean, do, must we eat all that much? And I feel great doing it once a day. So, I mean, if you take 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 a look at how long um, these bodies have been around and what type of uh, eating pattern that they were on, it wasn't even one one time a meal. It was just like when we can get food, you'd eat it, right? So, whatever's available. So, our bodies are highly designed to not eat frequently, like at the all-you-can-eat buffet. There's there's food available. Believe it or not, Steve, 24 hours a day. <laughs> um, in fact, people even have refrigerators filled with food as well as cupboards. And uh, so there's never a shortage uh, around in America and different countries. So the point is that, uh, no, our bodies do very, very good if you don't feed them so regular. And uh, one meal a day is if you have the nutrients, and that's why I, I recommend supplementing, uh, because the the like if you go to the grocery store right now, even at Whole Foods, these organic, you think you just, oh, yeah, I'm going to eat these organic foods, less pesticides. A lot of times they're like, they taste empty, a bell pepper, a tomato. And so unfortunately, the nutrients aren't always there. So um, this is one of the reasons why I'm going to start another channel on grow, growing your own food. You just having a garden. Um, that way you can control the nutrition in that food. When you actually consume food that is nutrient dense, wow, what a difference. You're now satisfied. I think a lot of kids don't even know what that is. 
But um, those of you that have a garden know what I'm talking about. It's like, it's satisfying, it's nutrient dense, and that's going to be something that's going to keep you healthy. Um, so then when you do keto and you're doing one meal a day, you have to make sure that you have all the nutrients in that meal. And uh, you might say, well, okay, so if I only have one meal, maybe I could do six, 700, 800, maybe 900 calories in the one meal if I'm lucky. Okay, well, realize that um, you're also having additional calories that is coming from burning your own fat, especially if you're low carb. Well, actually, only if you're low carb. Now you have the, your calories are really a lot more than that because you're living off your reserve as well. So it's not just the calories that are coming from the diet. Very interesting. Okay, we have got answers to our final quiz question. We don't always get to all of them, but we were uh, very organized today, and the audience was jumping on it. Quiz question asks, what's the common cause of chronic pain and tightness on the right side of your neck? And the audience suggests, or at least 75%, say gallbladder or bile salts issues. 20% say stress or congestion of the liver. 5% say pancreas malfunction. Well, the, the majority is correct. It is the gallbladder, sometimes the liver. It's a lack of bile, and the gallbladder gets sluggish. You don't necessarily have to have a gallstone to have this problem because if you don't have enough bile, the, the, the bile gets thicker, and it doesn't go through the tubes, and it starts to swell up the nerve the, uh, on the, in these little tubes. They're called ducts, and it swells up, and there's pain receptors that can be activated, and then also it, it puts pressure on this thing called the phrenic nerve that goes up up to the right side into your neck from your diaphragm. And I wish I know, knew about this when I had neck pain and tightness for 12 years, Steve. Being a chiropractor, now do you know how many adjustments I had to my neck? Probably close to a million. And it never solved the problem. Why? Because it was coming from my digestion. I had no idea the connection. And as soon as I, I made this connection, this link, and I started to do something about it, I changed my diet. Um, wow, what a difference it made. The pain went away. And uh, what a waste of those 12 years of just being in pain unnecessarily. So for those of you that have this right side issue, do an experiment right now. Just start massaging underneath your right rib cage. Just start you know, pressing in there and then see if your neck pain goes away. If it does, then we know there's a connection because when you step on a dog's tail, Steve, it barks to his mouth, right? Interesting. So there's a connection. The hip bone's connected to the thigh bone. <laughs> that makes that was, sense. I don't know where I'm going with that, but the yeah. point is that if you don't consume certain things that aggravate the gallbladder, um, your gallbladder is happier. And I talk about that, what to eat if you have gallbladder problems, but boy, boy, does it make your neck feel great and loose and you, and it's such a simple solution. Well, that's terrific. Well, I tell you what, we've saved our absolutely most exciting guest for the last, uh, Sanjay Singh, uh, from India. And I've kept him from celebrating. There's a lot going on down in uh, India today with a celebration. Sanjay, thanks for being so uh, patient with us. And if you're unmuted, go ahead with your question for Dr. Berg. Hello, Dr. Berg. It was amazing Hello. to meet you in live chat. Uh, okay, I had a problem in my right quadrant upper, right, where the gallbladder is 14 years back. So it was a mild pain. I went to the doctor and the doctor said, but they couldn't answer anything. So it continued seven years back. I had a problem. I couldn't put my bag in the aircraft. It was paining here, as I to, as you told just now. So I went to doctor again. Doctor couldn't find many doctors. They said, no, your liver is good. Your gallbladder is good. Ultrasound, everything. But one doctor said, okay, let me do your uh, thyroid check. And I have hypothyroid. My thyroid level were 125. So, okay, he started giving me levothyroxine, levothyroxine, but my pain was not going. So, last year during pandemic, I got some information about keto. Then I searched about, I got your videos and started doing keto. And uh, yes, my weight 
was reduced. I went from 80 to 66, 14 kilograms. Now I am 66, 67. 20 grams of carbohydrate per day. <laughs> that was what you recommended. With uh, So yes, uh, things went good. My health is fine. But even my, the pain here was reduced. But the pain didn't go. I did my ultrasound, everything is still there. So <laughs> I don't know uh, what what's going on. So my question is that, what is your advice? What should I do? Yeah, my family history, my mother has gallbladder removed in, at the age of 56. So I, I can feel a little bit bulge here sometimes because now I'm not in keto. I'm, I, I do around 50 grams, 50 to 100 grams sometimes like that. Because I'm 66 weight, I do intermittent fasting uh, in a week, almost three days, I don't eat alternate day. <laughs> so, <clears throat> okay. yeah, this so, is the issue. The pain still comes and goes. This this problem is difficult because it's not in, it's, easy, it's not easy to find. I had to order some of the uh, older textbooks on gallbladder, gallbladder physiology as well as bile physiology to find the answer to this. But uh, apparently, um, even on MRI, um, if there's sludge, which are kind of uh, almost like a border on cr crystallization of this uh, this bile because it's getting too thick, it, sometimes it doesn't even show up on an MRI. So it's, it's no, hard I had to MRI. Right. right. I had right. MRI also. It didn't, didn't show, it didn't show up. It didn't no, show up. No, so, no, no. Right. So here's here's... What's happening is your bile that is flowing from your liver through the bile ducts and um, is is too thick, and it's creating a distension. It's it's distending and it's creating a balloon effect. And so there's a great video that I did on gallbladder flushing. You can manually work on the area to help get some relief. But in the, but long term what you need to do is to thin the bile out. Thin your bile out so it drains properly. What is the best way to do that? Tudka. T-U-D-C-A. Tudka. Order that online. It's a nutritional product. It's a type of purified bile salt that's wonderful for this. And uh, you take two on an empty stomach in the morning and then another two in the afternoon on an empty stomach. And what's going to happen is it's going to open up the floodgates through these ducts. It's going to thin the bile and give you some relief. It's called Tudka. Watch my videos on that. Okay. okay. Well, that's great. So well, thank you so much. Thing. Sanjay, did yeah, you have my, something my, else my, to say? My yeah. yeah, my cholesterol levels were also high during that time. So there is also one I couldn't... Uh, that is, that's because bile is necessary to break down the cholesterol and you don't have enough because it's because what keeps the sludge from developing is the higher concentration of bile salts to cholesterol. So you just need to increase your, your uh, bile salts. And probably the reason why you're not, you don't have enough bile salts is because you might have a fatty liver and, or there could be some damage in liver and, and you are, you're, I guess your your parents or um, have um, I think they had a gallbladder issue too. So what you know, the, I'm not saying it's genetic. I'm saying probably they ate what you ate growing up. And um, I know this might be shocking to some people, but in India, everyone doesn't always do 100% low carb. I know this is shocking information. <laughs> um, they no, no, we we we, we eat a lot of carb. No, I'm just, I'm just being, I'm just, I'm just playing with you. <laughs> but um, I know in, in India they don't use sugar or wheat products or grains, so you're safe on that one. I'm being very <laughs> sarcastic. Um, but yeah, so get some tutka, and then tutka. take it for a week, and then come back and talk to us. I think you'll be quite happy with the results. Well, okay, Sanjay, okay. thank you for. I will try to. That's great. Thanks for thank joining you. us, Sanjay, and enjoy the celebration you, going on down there. Uh, and Dr. Berg, why don't we quickly go through some exciting videos that are going to be available to your audience? Okay, we're going to talk about uh, uh, multiple sclerosis and stem cell therapy. Uh, it looks very hopeful. Um, at least one of the things, one one of the stem cell. 
uh, programs. Uh, we're going to talk about the benefits of sugar, the amazing benefits of sugar. I'll, I'll, I'll really can't wait to see the reaction on that video. Um, we'll talk more about the American wheat versus the European wheat. Also, we'll talk about the nuts and the phytic acid, the best and worst seeds. But there's other videos that I'm going to I'm going to talk about too. Let me just uh, see the ones that I'm doing today. We're going to talk about what is healthier, kefir or kombucha tea. How about that one for a video? We'll talk about the um, the health risks of night shift workers, and we're going to talk about why avocados help you lose weight. Um, talk about all natural beta blockers, more data on Dead Sea salts, um, and the best way to get off sugar, if you're on sugar. There's people that have been watching my videos and they're still eating sugar, so we need to help you with that. And uh, I, have a, I have the best way to do it. So stay tuned for more and thank you for your attention. I'll talk to you guys next week. Have a wonderful weekend.